recording has Hi, Federica. Hi. Hi, how are you? All right, how are you? I'm good. We're going to wait, obviously, a few more minutes before we start. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Rachel. Great. Hi. Hi, Fred. How are you doing? Hi, people are joining. We should wait. Uh, Jacques is already here. Excellent. Uh, we should wait a couple more minutes. Also, we don't have picture yet. I don't think we do, so we're definitely going to wait a couple more minutes. Hi, Rachel. Rachel agreed to take notes for us. Thank you very much. I'll probably ask rotating chairs to uh, do the honors of taking notes because I am unable to do that coherently. Um, so thank you very much for helping out, Rachel, this time. Sure.
Jaco, are you online? Can you hear me? I can. And Victor just I just joined. wanted to... Excellent, fantastic. Um, Jaco, I just wanted to make sure you mentioned the recording is going to start automatically. I don't see any signs of it. Yeah, I so can see I'm just... the recording. It is being recorded. I think it when I logged in, a voice said recording had started. Excellent. And there's a red dot in the upper right. Correct. That's the signal that is recording. Oh, on the upper right of my own window. Okay, awesome. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for joining. I think we have critical mass. So um, we had a small hiatus uh, in these calls, but we're going to try to make them um, as regular as possible going forward. That a monthly cadence. The next one is going to be in January. Just no need to add one in December since it's already the end of November. Um, but we have a, a small schedule that Jaco and I have put together, and I'll submit it to you all um, in the next few days. So Victor today agreed. Thank you, Victor. Victor is the LSSD project manager, and he agreed to tell us about the plan for LSSD in 2018, uh, which is a topic that was originally proposed by Megan. Thank you, Megan, for proposing the topic. Um, so unless there are some really, really critical questions, I recommend the questions get submitted through the chat. I will try and monitor the chat, and then if I see any questions that are um, compelling uh, during the talk, maybe, Victor, I will stop you if I see a, a point where the talk can be stopped and ask them. Otherwise, we'll ask them at the end. And if there are no objections, I think we can proceed. Wait, is on. Wait. Wait. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. So I'm going to go ahead and share a screen here so I can present. Also, let me add, if you didn't check your email, uh, the slides were shared on email as well as on Slack on the side um, chairs panel. And there may be uh, one or two slight differences, but I think they're... You're really, really faint for some reason. I have the same problem. Yeah, a couple of people mentioned that on on the chat as well. You're just not very loud, Victor. <laughs> don't usually have that problem. But I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna start by show by starting the slide presentation and then if you give me thirty seconds I will get a different microphone. Okay, perfect. Also um Phil is asking if the slides are if we can share the slides publicly or if we can share them I guess at least with the rest of the collaboration. I believe that these are suitable for sharing, yes. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to take this minute then to mention I want to make this um, I want to open a channel on community to discuss these talks further and to share the content of the talks the menu and the slides uh, more broadly with the science collaborations um, with the entire science collaborations and hopefully um, to have intra collaboration conversations about these meetings so i'll open a channel on community we'll upload the slides as well as the menu of the meeting there it will be also linked through the slides and the video that are posted on the scientists lssc page so you get a link on that on slack link to that on slack okay how about this that's so much better. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so uh, thank you again. Um, and also, feel free to break in at any moment. Um, I'm fine with 
I'm making this a little bit of a conversation if we get to that point. Uh, so feel free to break in at any moment. If I can tell that you're trying, if that you're trying to do it, I'll try to acknowledge. Uh, so what I put together here was uh, a little bit of a status as well as some interjection on what the 2018 looks like. Uh, so I, d I felt like 2018 might need some context so you understood a little bit about where we are today. Uh, and I might go through this fairly rapidly. Uh, it's hard for me to appreciate exactly how much of this might have already been discussed in various forums and how much of this you might already know about. So I thought if I just go quickly through it, then I'm happy to retrace and, and talk about any aspect that catches your attention. So just to start with, as a project, uh, from the project standpoint, just to get the numbers over with, this is, I promise this is the only number slide that I show from a, from a management standpoint. Um, just a reminder that we do have two phases of the project. We do have an NSF side and a DOE side, and those uh, projects are at, have a total project cost of 473 for NSF and 168 for the DOE. And if I just skip down to the fourth line, to give you a sense of how far along the whole project is in, in terms of uh, percent complete. And so on the NSF side, we're almost 50% done at, by the end of September or at the end of September. And on the DOE side, the, the LSSD camera fabrication is at 72% complete. Uh, on both sides, we have a remaining contingency. And um, I would just, I would, I would list, I would describe that contingency as uh, it looks reasonable for this stage, but it's really quite tight because we can now start to predict all of the things that are that are going to be calls on contingencies that are still risks in the project. And so um, I, I don't want to over I don't want to make it sound too great that we have uh, almost 30% contingency uh, because a lot of that is starting to be uh, spoken for in, in in some of the risk areas. So, uh, but overall, I would just say that the, the project is in good shape. Um, and uh, by the numbers is is progressing quite well. If we look at uh, now go into some more of the de some of the details, um, I have some some very image based um, slides here for the construction and fabrication parts of the project. And this is a really good example, the iconic how well are we doing on the summit? Uh, and on the left, you can see our early rendering of what the summit facility would look like. Uh, on the right is uh, a picture taken today, um, and uh, so the, clearly the building on the summit is is moving along quite well. Uh, for 2018, I would ex you can expect that the fixed bricks and mortar part of the building, or otherwise known as the the, the prime contractor, will be completing their effort in uh, in January, and then the 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 principal activity will be. Uh, in erecting the dome, which is a different contractor. Uh, and that dome will be the primary uh, activity for the first half of the year. Um, and hopefully uh, come about August timeframe, uh, that will be looking quite mu quite a lot like what you see on the left. And so here's, uh, here's, the, here's a slide just showing some of the dome activities. Uh, that act, the, even though the prime contractor is not yet complete, uh, we have started an overlap activity and uh, the dome erection has started. Uh, it starts with the interface to the brick, to, to the form, um, to the concrete of the lower enclosure you can see on the far left, uh, rail assembly, and again, a picture taken today in the bottom right, uh, which is the box beam and um, bogey assembly, the rail uh, and wheel assembly for the dome. So you can start to see that that, that assembly and erection process is, is very much uh, in, in, in full swing. Another uh, key activity, of course, is the telescope mount itself. Uh, and on this slide, number five, uh, you can also see, again, the rendering on the left of the design and a picture on the right uh, taken a couple of weeks ago uh, of the trial assembly in the factory in Spain, uh, of the status of that activity. Uh, the next slide six, uh, you can see some more of the components, uh, including the top end that was missing in the previous picture. And on the right, although the image is not very clear, uh, that is the cable wrap assembly uh, for the camera itself that allows the camera to rotate uh, on the top end. 
and and that was quite an quite an ambitious uh, activity for those of you that are familiar with um, the the telescopes and where they often fail it's often in the cable wraps and they end up being very difficult and so we put a lot of attention uh, in this particular uh, fabrication effort uh, which is why it warrants a picture there on the right uh, that that overall factory uh, testing has been going quite well uh, and the assembly is coming together nicely uh, even to the point of having tested the hydrostatic bearing system um, and starting to uh, get to what you see in slide seven, which on the video probably is a little bit uh, fragmented. It's much smoother in real life, but uh, just to show you a little bit of uh, what the telescope now looks like. And the video is nice because it actually shows people in the scale. Uh, so you start to get a sense of um, not just what the progress looks like, uh, but what the scale of, uh, of that factory and what that factory assembly was looking like. So again, that was uh, also just uh, this week. In other uh, areas of progress, uh, the coating plant is being developed by a company, Von Ardine, in Germany. Uh, they are also moving quite far along, uh, having already built the, the, the chamber and done the vacuum testing. Um, and the chamber, you can see in the image on the left. On the right, they're also responsible for the whole cleaning station uh, and the, the coating stripping uh, and, and coating prep area. And so that's some of the boom crane, oh, some of the steel hardware uh, that you see required to uh, do those functions um, right before we, we can actually coat a mirror. And so that's all working, working well and should also see a completion in the factory in 2018 uh, with shipping planned in about the June time period. Another real critical activity, I think uh, hopefully you've all seen pictures of the actual primary mirror uh, from the past before we actually stored it. Um, that's been in storage for several years now, waiting for us to complete the activity noted here, which is the entire assembly um, for, uh, for supporting that glass, uh, which takes not just a very large steel uh, cell, which is the turquoise item that the gentleman on the left is standing on and you can see on the right, uh, but also an incredible amount of electromechanics, hardware, pneumatics, um, and uh, other devices to properly support that mirror. Uh, and on the image on the right, that, um, that's, that rusty steel item is, is the dummy mirror for the primary tertiary mirror. Uh, we actually put a significant amount of engineering effort into that particular item so that it's not just a, uh, a surrogate mass, but it's also representative of the volume, uh, so we can do further testing of it without having to put the glass in jeopardy. And it's also structurally very similar to the glass, and so we can also do further testing of all of those mechanics um, and hardware that, that has to properly support the glass before we put the glass in jeopardy. And so this, uh, this has also been a, uh, one of the activities that we have performed what I'll call in-house because it's uh, mostly LSST personnel working on uh, on that particular. Um, that particular. Uh, another area in uh, what's uh, the what we consider to be the telescope and sight scope is in the auxiliary telescope, and you might recall that we do have a 1.2 meter class telescope that we will deploy on the neighboring summit. Um, to primarily look at water vapor and uh, look at transmissive, uh, the, the transmissive functions of the atmosphere while the main telescope is operating. And what you can see on the left is um, that telescope previously was Calypso, a Calypso telescope on Kitt Peak uh, that was donated to us. We've refurbished it. Uh, that refurbishment is nearly complete um, and we will be sending it to the summit to go in the dome that's uh, in the foreground of the image on the right, um, and that, that should be sent down also in 2018 um, in the mid to, to later part of the year uh, going into sort of a commissioning phase. So all of this, um, if we now focus on, so 2018, uh, almost every picture I showed has hardware going to the summit uh, in, the, in the next fiscal year or the next calendar year. And so the next two slides is really just to really emphasize mostly for our logistics team 
just what is coming our what it, what is coming and what we're preparing for. So uh, the slide on 11 is just a is a screenshot of one of our spreadsheets that shows there's nearly a hundred million dollars replacement cost of hardware that is being shipped in 2018 to the summit. And it's not just sort of about 30 items that don't fit in containers, but it's also, if you look on the next slide, it's something like 70 different containers of material that are all going to be shipped to the summit. Uh, and so in total, uh, we're making plans for um, a lot of cargo to be shipped and something like an equivalent of 100 uh, truckloads of, of, of items to get to the summit. So anytime you see a picture of the summit, uh, you see how tight the, the top area is, the top, top plateau. Uh, it, this, these kinds of slides and these kinds of numbers of items um, sort of brings to reality the, the, uh, just the effort that's involved for the team on the summit. And all of that is uh, planned for the latter part of uh, 2018. In addition to the sort of the, the main construction activities uh, that we often talk about in the summit, we're also building a 10 person or 10 room addition to um, the hotel on Sarah Pachon. And that activity is also starting this year. Uh, we've uh, just finished the architectural work. The image on the right, the first two uh, wings um, towards the lower right are existing. And it's the top left one that is uh, LSST's uh, new contribution with 10, 10 rooms. In addition, we have another construction site, which is on the in the base uh, in La Serena itself, and that you can see on slide number 14. Uh, we have been doing a joint project with our neighbors and with Aura um, to do a quite a substantial refurbishment of existing facilities that also ostensibly makes room for uh, the fairly large addition that LSST is required to. Uh, to, to put in place to support the ops team mm. um, with basic office space, but also for the data acquisition for the for the base uh, data system. And so the image right there, anything in sort of yellow tan is is existing buildings, and what's in the greenish uh, color is the new LSST additions. And in the top right green smaller portion of the T, uh, that is the data facility. So if I change uh, and, and turn our focus a little bit to some of the other fabrication activities, in particular the camera area, uh, one of the key aspects uh, and one of the key risks for the camera uh, fabrication all along has been in sensor delivery. And uh, as of this month, um, we, we can report that 56% of all the sensors, or 118 out of the 208 that we need, have been delivered for the science grade. Uh, to go into the focal plane. Uh, there's another 20 that are not 100% to spec, and so we have them sort of a science grade reserve because there's some feature on there that we that that, that we don't like uh, that doesn't make them fully qualified. But we would certainly use them if if uh, if pressed. And so that's another 20. And so we're you know if 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 all else failed, we'd have 66% of the of the sensors uh, as of today. And so that's that's moving quite uh, quite well at this point, and and most importantly is that both of the fabrication efforts and the assemblies at both of the of the two vendors E2V and ITL, uh, they're on a good trajectory. Their deliveries over the last um, several months um, have been uh, consistent with the trajectory that we need to see uh, keep happening. Past performance is is often not a, is is not often the perfect indicator of the future. Um, but uh, at this point in time, things are looking uh, pretty pretty good in that in that particular risk area. Of course, those sensors uh, need to be turned into uh, a focal plane, and you may uh, recall that our focal plane is made up of 189 of these 4K by 4K devices, and we build those build up that focal plane in rafts, and each each raft is nine sensors. And so what you see here is uh, we start talking about raft tower modules. Uh, eight of them have already been completed, including uh, two engineering test rafts. And what you can see here is the pictures. In the pictures is uh, one of them on the left and several of them um, loaded up 
uh, in the test, uh, testing area um, uh, on the right hand in the right hand image. And and to to sort of further emphasize what you're seeing there, each raft, in addition to the nine sensors, includes all of the electronics and utilities to drive those sensors and read out those sensors um, in within the same footprint. And so you see uh, the electronics is what's sticking up in that image with the sensors at the bottom of uh, of each of those assemblies facing down. And of course, the and and the way that the the activity has been organized, these rafts are being built up um, at Brookhaven and then being sent over to Slack for integration uh, into the overall camera. Another critical area for, for, the, for the camera is in the lenses. Uh, you'll recall that the, um, the camera has three um, uh, refractive optics at the front, uh, two L1, L2, and then L3 is the window uh, to the doer. And those activities are moving along. Uh, if you've watched or heard along the way, we've, we've had our share of issues uh, with some of the fabrication efforts. But in every case right now, uh, they are moving along and um, on, on our revised schedule. But, our, but fabrication is looking good. And here you can see some of those images um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the various pictures here. Uh, I guess the, the other the other point to make is uh, one of the complications that the that the camera team had to had to work through is that the broadband coding is being provided by uh, separate vendors from those that are providing the optical fabrication, and so that puts an added an added activity on the on the actual project team itself. Um, but it's so uh, happy to report that those lenses are on their way to Europe for getting that broadband uh, reflective coding as um, installed or, or applied. Uh, and so those uh, those lenses are really getting to the final stages of, of fabrication and delivery. There's a significant effort going on uh, with the camera filter, the exchange mechanism um, in, in France. And here you can see some of the images of the uh, auto filter changer and the rotator. Uh, we carry five filters in the camera at any one time. And of course, those five filters need to be um, stored and be able to be in inserted at any time. And so that mechanism, uh, including the carousel and the insertion mechanism, is a significant uh, electromechanical device that the, the French have been working on for several years. And uh, as you can see from these pictures, that's, uh, that's that the, the progress has been excellent uh, with delivery expected late um, uh, in, in about a year or so. Other uh, areas of uh, critical fabrication for the camera has been sort of the, the, the cryostat, which you can see on the far left. Uh, the grid itself, it's a seasick uh, grid, which is the, the, the back plane or the support structure for all of the uh, 21 rafts that are in it and the four uh, corner rafts. Those are all mounted to, to that grid. And so that's been a, a particularly critical fabrication item. Uh, you might have heard that uh, last year we did have uh, a tool break one small part of it that, that has been repaired. Uh, and uh, the, the repaired item has been uh, fully tested um, and is fully uh, meets all requirements and has been delivered and is sitting at Slack waiting for uh, final integration. And lastly, on the far right, another critical item has been the cryoplate. Uh, this has also been quite a challenging fabrication effort. Uh, this is what um, provides the main cooling um, um, heat sink for all of the rafts and becomes a very critical item to the overall focal plane operation. And so that, uh, that's that been a, um, a high risk item for, for the camera team for some time now. And everybody's looking forward to that delivery uh, late this month um, and getting it to Slack uh, early in the year. So there's a, sort of a really quick walkthrough of uh, where the main fabrication items are. There's, in, there's incredible amounts of other activities that are going on, of course, um, in those uh, in that sort of area of the project, which is what I've sort of labeled as the construction and, and fabrication areas of the telescope and camera. Uh, and as we really focus on those parts, we also have to be really cognizant of just, how, just the, the whole safety aspects 
And so we have uh, really worked hard as a project to, uh, on both the NSF and the DOE side to really make safety a, uh, a, a an important part of the culture. And so uh, we've been, you know, that, that team, which includes people here at the project office and at Slack, have been working hard and working together to make sure that we, we, we present safety as a single project uh, effort and, and really focus on it, uh, not just with our own people, but with our vendors. And uh, just to emphasize uh, just the challenges that that team faces, it's not just uh, the fabrication of our own things, it's, it's working with vendors, it's making sure that that culture is embedded right at the get-go with looking at the hazard analyses and so forth. Uh, but also, we're well distributed at this point. Uh, with I, I mentioned the summit base activity, summit activity, the base activity, um, the hotel on the summit. So there's three major construction areas, uh, as well as some fairly significant fabrication items that are going on, uh, both here in Tucson and at SLAC uh, and Brookhaven. So there's a lot of activity going on there. Uh, and I just uh, want to emphasize that this is something that we take quite seriously and uh, work hard to uh, to keep all work moving and, and, and working along quite well. So now if I switch over to uh, the other uh, significant element of the project. I'm sorry, sorry there Victor, question? then there is a question. Yeah, there's a question by Phil Marshall, which may be worth asking at this point before you switch. Uh, what would the impact on camera performance or image quality be if the L1 fracture was not repaired? I believe, and I think that uh, if Steve Ritz is on, he might actually have authored some of the analysis to look into that. Um, and at this point in time, every single feature, my, my general response is every feature that we have, um, that we understand exists, has been evaluated, and we have reports that we can share on what the overall uh, scientific and technical performance impact would be. And I know that that's not as satisfying as here's the quantitative evaluation, but I'd have to look up the actual numbers. So, Victor, uh, this is Chuck. Um, um, I don't know if Steve Ritz is on, but the short answer is nothing noticeable. It's, it's at the at the at the negligible level um, as far as impact on science performance. Equally non-quantitative, but. Well, yeah, it's, well, worth, can, it's, the, the, it's unmeasurable as far as impact on throughput and impact on PSF. Yeah, you should emphasize, the, this is Steve Kahn, the reason for repair is actually not to improve performance. The reason for repair is to polish out the figure so it's not a source of further fracture and a stress concentration. So it's really unrelated, it's completely unrelated to performance. It's it's just uh, the safety margin for the, the lens. That's Thank a, you. Phil sent a smiley face yeah. on the chat. So I think we're happy. Okay. Yeah, I think Steve's point is really good. It's really important that that we understand when we, when there is an issue, particularly with glass, uh, we look at it from two standpoints. One is overall system performance, but also uh, the technical performance and the technical safety of the glass itself, and and, and passivating um, the glass so that there's no further fracture uh, is a, is an extremely important part of any of those repairs. Okay, so I was about to uh, to step into the into the data management area of of activity and. I assume that I don't have to go into the details of, of, of our data products. I think that uh, there's lots of good documentation that exists. When I did want to just point, I just want to put this slide out there. Uh, and the, the main message I wanted to give you was that we have gotten feedback from many of you uh, on this call uh, to discuss the, the ambiguity of level one, level two, and level three. And what you should be seeing in the documentation that is that is coming out very soon, or in fact has come out, is this uh, this change of nomenclature where the, the the stream of time domain events that comes out on a nightly level we will call no longer level one, but we'll call level we'll call the nightly data product. Uh, and then there's the 
the database itself of all of the uh, of, of, of the catalog of objects, and that will be no longer referred to as level two, but will be referred to as the data release data product. And lastly, um, we've always discussed the ability for um, people to federate into the, the, the software that we provide or into the infrastructure that we provide. And so that data product uh, and that, that capability will be referred to as user generated data products. And so that um, this is actually quite new and fresh um, and um, is in direct response to a lot of the feedback that we've gotten from, uh, from like I said, many of you on this call. You mentioned that so, the documentation has been released about this. Uh, so I believe that um, th those of you that provided feedback to Mario's uh, slide set on this topic have probably seen the discussion and um, will certainly be seeing the the reports that come out on declaring the num the, the 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 terminology that I just used. But if you aren't on that on, on that, you'll see it in the update to the. Um, to the status paper that Jelko is is updating right now. So maybe Beth or Jelko want to say more about how people will hear about this officially. Uh, however, those were the those are the terminology that we were uh, leaning towards. Uh, yeah, that's great. So um, I think that we've almost closed the loop on minor edits to the slide deck that was shared with the science chairs a month or two ago uh, by me, and then once. Uh, those edits are finalized and that gets a uh, LSST document number, I'll recirculate it to the science chairs. Um, and of course, you'd be free to share it with your science collaborations at, at that time, if not already, and that will have the terminology. Uh, and yes, to Victor's good point about uh, uh, Joko's led update to the overview paper, uh, deploying this new terminology. And as the members of the uh, data management subsystem science team are interacting with the individual science collaborations, um, they will also uh, start to, uh, to demonstrate and to use this terminology. Thank you. Okay, so um, from a status standpoint uh, on the LS, on the data management side, uh, this slide uh, you can read in, in further detail, but I think the, the heading is really what's important. And over the last year and a half, I think the, the data management science group has really focused on uh, what are the user needs and thinking about what the capability of the data management system needs to be to support the users. And uh, what you can see here is sort of the sort of classes of in, in this incremental, uh, very coarse class of, of, of user, where the first two bullets are sort of maybe referred to as the, the introduction, introduction, those that want to just get a small data set, bring them to their, bring them home, do their own analysis either uh, locally or with maybe their own um, uh, well understood and, and data, uh, data tools. And so there's there's sort of a that level of, of, of engagement that we have to support and recognize. And then of course you get into the next level, which would be the third bullet. There's gonna be a certain, uh, I would actually assume is gonna be the bulk of the users, uh, but that's just my perspective. Um, it, uh, the people that are going to want to really engage much more closely with the data are going to bring maybe their analysis to the data itself um, and really address their science cases uh, where some people might need more computing but not more space, more, but some might need more space and less computing, but it really is done best really local uh, on, on LSST hardware. And so that capability has to be understood and supported and then there's going to be uh, the very demanding user base, uh, those people that are going to want to uh, either take LSS, not necessarily LSST resources for computing, but but bring the data or or marry the uh, other capabilities, uh, super compute, higher level computing capability with our data set. And so we also have to be able to to, to support that kind of um, that kind of analysis. And then finally. There's the, the, there's the user groups that will want to set up their own data centers. And, and if they've got data rights, uh, take the data themselves and bring them into local, um, in, into local data access centers of their own. So 
this is a fairly coarse way to look at it, but really has been a very has been a big help to the data management team to really focus on what the delivery should be and to really make sure that what gets delivered is usable from um, from a scientific standpoint. And the way that that turned in what that turned into is and I, again here I assume that many of you have already heard much of this and seen many of the presentations and some of the material, uh, particularly over the last year that Mario would have presented. It, you get to this uh, th this idea of a science platform, uh, and that platform has has as you can see in the sort of the middle or the the top blue line, sort of this three levels of engagement, uh, where we discuss the portal as those people that are going to just do small data release uh, exports or imports work with it in that sense. Then there's sort of the middle group where you really want to uh, engage more fully go to our data set, and that's where you're going to work off of uh, these uh, Jupyter Lab notebooks um, and really support your science mission in that way. And then, of course, there's the full APIs for the much more robust engagement. Uh, and, and so this has been a significant focus over the last year in defining what the data management system really has to be. Uh, we've been talking for years about general capabilities, and, and put numbers down for what that looks like. Um, but the team has really put a lot of um, really crisp uh, and, and um, significant effort into getting um, this idea of a science platform in place. And, and again, the, the documentation that exists in both slides and in data management reports uh, is really quite good in describing what, uh, what we have in mind at this point. So with that as our uh, as the objective, you see in the next couple of slides some of the uh, some some of the various aspects where the portal um, is very much Firefly based at the moment, and uh, you can see here on this screenshot the kinds of things that is anticipated uh, to be capable uh, in that aspect of the um, uh, of the platform, and some of the existing data sets and so and so forth, and, and analysis that's already been used uh, in that context. And then on slide 25, uh, we focus on the, the Jupyter Lab notebook. Um, and then 26, now 25, is, there's no other image. Um, you, you start to get a sense of what we're thinking about here. And again, I'm not going to do it as much justice as some of these other materials uh, that, we've, that we've made available in the, in the past. Um, but I think that the bottom line is that the, the, the crispness in where the DM design is headed is now well established, and uh, I, I hope that you've all had the opportunity uh, to engage in some of those details. And then I, uh, so 26 is, a, is similar. You can read through that for for the uh, for the last part of the um, of what we're anticipating for for being able to interact with this with the platform. So I put this uh, this last slide this uh, on DM, sort of thinking about what does this all look like for 2018, and. Another concept that's really been fo a focus for uh, the planning for data management has been in what we've been calling the minimum viable system. And what we really want to do is get to the point where uh, the system gets to that stage and then continues to increment in its capabilities going forward. Uh, and so that, the, the, that we can really emphasize the fact that it's not like data management is, is not there until suddenly it is. In fact, it's very capable today. We are doing a lot of uh, very interesting analyses with various portions uh, of the data manage uh, of the LSST stack. And uh, one way to really emphasize that is to get to this minimum viable system. And so that's one of the things that we should be seeing uh, later on in 2018 is to get hardware and, pro and, and some of the processes in place to really demonstrate that. Some of those details are in the or in the next five bullets, uh, where you can see some examples of things that are going to be replaced or be put in place as capabilities um, over the next year, uh, including very soon uh, some replacement in, in, of um, particular algorithms in January. Uh, at the end of the next cycle, you'll see some um, scaled versions of data uh, alerts. Um, and then you start to see some additional 
very um, hardware focused and, and system capability focused uh, milestones later in the in the calendar year, including the network uh, and then the calibration system. You, I mentioned that the cal the calibration telescope would be up and running in 2018, and what we would like to do is be able to start commissioning that and actually pushing real data uh, into the data management system as well and doing some very early uh, commissioning of, of more of the system using the uh, spectrograph that will be in existence. So you get a sense here of what's, uh, what 2018 will look like uh, for data management as well. And then uh, I have a few more slides to sort of show overall, if, if, if you think about the things that I just mentioned as really being very focused on the three major subsystems, data management, telescope and site, and camera, and all leading up to a certain level of capability, uh, which we've always discussed as sort of being the higher level of organization for the project, and then leading into what we now call commissioning. And this slide really shows uh, we use this to show where the schedule contingency is, but also to show show the phases of this work. And uh, as we as we finish up those major those or the three major subsystems, really focus on getting complete. Um, it's the it's the commissioning activity that really has to start ramping up. And that's shown on this particular slide is in purple. Um, and and Chuck uh, has probably had had opportunities to talk to several of, uh, of you on, uh, on his plans, uh, and, I'll, and I'll touch on those a little bit here in the next few slides. But that reactivity is really starting now, and that's really another focus of this slide, is to, sh is to really emphasize that it's not just three subsystems coming together and then suddenly commissioning starts, but Chuck is already starting to work on building up his team and preparing the tools necessary uh, to do the various parts of that commissioning activity. And then, of course, in the bottom right, you also see that we're also thinking a lot about how we transition and how ramp, how full operation ramps up. And so, again, this is a is a bit of a cartoon, uh, but it really gives us the opportunity to talk to these various phases and to really emphasize not just critical path from a schedule standpoint, not just when things are going to get done, but just what things are happening in parallel and how these other activities need to start uh, start ramping up. And so here's another, on slide 29, um, is another view of the commissioning activity and some of the sequencing. <clears throat> if you've heard us talk in the past, you've heard us describe commissioning as the first phase being integration and test, the second phase being science validation. But in fact, when we really start to focus on what does that really mean, you get into these, uh, Chuck is now describing as four phases. The, the preparation phase, and then there's an early integration and test phase where we'll be using a single raft camera called CompCam, uh, which will be used to really debug a lot of the system with this much, which is much simpler, um, but very capable camera. And then when the full camera arrives, then we're getting the full system integration and test, and then the science validation starts. And if I go to the next slide, slide 30, there's another way to look at it, and it really allows me to emphasize that that last phase is not just science validation and verification, but it's really just a whole series of mini surveys. Um, and in fact, uh, in this particular viewpoint, what you can see is, yeah, there's some installations and there's some various integration activities, but really the commissioning activity is to validate uh, what's happening and, and to verify that what we're doing is, is meeting the requirements. And so in each case, Chuck has identified a series of tests that will be performed uh, to really uh, emphasize that the level of integration has been completed successfully. And then the last slide, 31, gives you a sense of, of, of what the current milestone dates are for these various levels of, of uh, commissioning completion <clears throat> as, as we get into the end game. So, Again, I didn't want to use all the time, um, and so I, I went through a lot of that really quickly. Uh, but I think the bottom line is that uh, I think the project is in a really good state. Uh, we are, we're, it is busy everywhere, in every corner uh, across the globe, working on various elements of LSST. Um, the, the construction activities that I've mentioned, the fabrication activities, 
both for the telescope and for the for the camera, even the machine integration going on for data management, um, all of the software development, these they're all at various states of completion um, and, and uh, all coming together um, over the next uh, couple of years. And so I think 2018, not just, you know, we 2017 saw the building sort of take form, uh, but 2018, a lot of activity, a lot of hardware is going to be getting to that level of completion uh, from the factory and getting into the next stage of, of, uh, of delivery to the site. So I, I, I sort of have described it as a fairly transformative year uh, for the project. <clears throat> Brilliant. So. Should we open the floor for questions instead of going into the backup slides, unless there is anything? Um, I've seen I wasn't the next planning season. on going over the backup slides. Those were really just there Perfect. for conversation backup. if we got to it. Excellent. So, anybody has any questions? Now is the time. Why don't well, I, I start? I, Go I, ahead. I, have, I have one. This is Neil Brandt. Um, first of all, thank you. This is all great and, and very exciting. Um, I did want to ask the status on the of, of the call for mini surveys white papers. I recall um, on the SAC there was discussion that there would be a likely deadline for these of April 2018, but I haven't yet seen a call for proposals or or even seen a proto call for proposals uh, that would be discussed and revised by the SAC or by others. And so I just would like to know the status of that. Thanks. Joko, you want So for various reasons, we had to delay it a little bit. One of which is that we want to issue two calls together that originally we planned as two, it will be one following SIC advice. So right now we hope to have it released, the call itself in June, with the deadline for submitting white papers after summer, maybe October or November, something like that. We will okay. definitely run the draft by SAC and various other reports. And we will start working on draft as soon as the overview paper is out, so roughly in January. So SAC should expect to see something in February, by the end of February at the latest. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me ask, let me ask you, Zelko and Beth, I uh, just want to point out that this timeline is quite critical for the science collaborations to organize meetings around these calls. So please keep us updated as this timeline may evolve, if it, if it may evolve more and as it approaches to being finalized, it's important for the science collaborations to know um, when the calls are going to be ahead of Understood. ahead of time enough to be able to organize a meeting. Definitely. Thank you. That's a great point. And uh, Joko, my, Joko, my understanding is that we're going to come, uh, we being me, uh, with input from you, come prepared to the AAS with a slide that summarizes the dates so the community knows what to expect. So A, Joko, is that correct? And then B, if it is correct, uh, Federica's good point reminds me that whatever we show at AAS should be, we should be sure to connect the science chairs with those slides. I believe so, yes. Okay, great. So that's the timing that you all can expect beginning of January. Brilliant, thank you. I just a very quick there comment. There was... <clears throat> Sorry. Mm -hmm. the, the mini surveys that Neil was asking about, they are different from the mini surveys on Victor's slides, is that right? The commissioning mini surveys are different from the mini surveys being called for. Correct. So then as a follow-up then, the mini surveys in commissioning, are they already defined? What, what's, the, what's the process going to be for designing those mini surveys? Still working some of that out, Phil, but the, the primary objective of these mini surveys, of course, is to verify and validate the, the performance as defined in the science requirements document and the um, other documents down there. What we have talked about in the past is um, 
calling for suggestions of say places on the sky or perhaps some interesting cadences that would be done in a, a opportunistic kind of way without any guarantees being made because the first and foremost objective of commissioning is to deliver on the uh, the performance in the science requirements document is that so we we have talked about making a call for and, and providing a, a means for input to the commissioning effort. Myself, Steve and Victor and Beth, we haven't actually worked out the final details and, and when we would open that up. But um, so I would have to say stay tuned for now. Thanks. Uh, there's a question by Megan. Megan, do you want to ask it yourself? So I just had a question about ENCOA, since um, being at Gemini, I keep hearing lots about it. Um, how, if, if any, impact does, because um, LSST will fall in as well as Gemini and NOAO will be one big happy family in, in some sense. So I was just wondering how, in terms of some of the operations, if there will be any impact from joining ENCOA, which is supposed to be at the end of 2018, or, or if there is any impact um, positive or negative that might be happening. It may be not impacted at all, but I was just curious sort of how ENCOA might fit into what's going on in 2018. Um, and actually there is a question, a related question that I need to premise, what is ENCOA? So whoever answers the question maybe wants to spell out the acronym. Steve, do you want to take that or shall I? start and then and then you go on Beth. so just the first point um, which, which I'll just make a brief point and then Beth can talk more about the details so first off the construction project per se will never be part of ENCOA the construction project is its own or a center and will play out until completion and then disappear uh, and commissioning is part of construction so most of what we've been talking about for the near term of how we go into commissioning is unaffected by ENCOA to some degree by definition. What will go into ENCOA is the operations of LSST as facility. Now, of course, that's 100% operations once we officially start the survey in October 2022, uh, but there's a ramp up uh, of the operations funding line, which will be under the auspices of ENCOA. Uh, that Beth will lead, that will begin in 18, actually, at a small level and continue up through uh, through 2021, 20, 22, until it continues asymptotically into the full operation. So, Beth, let me just leave it to you then to talk about how that fits. Great. So, the functionality that we plan for LSST operations is not at all affected by the implementation of ENCOA, um, but I believe that our ability to recruit and retain a strong workforce through the entire 10-year LSST experiment is strengthened by the presence of ENCOA, right? So LSST has been proposed as this uh, fixed length experiment. And because, uh, Steve, we never defined ENCOA. <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna, sorry. Uh, I figured, oh, Steve's gonna define ENCOA, but I just, I'm gonna finish my sentence, then I'm gonna define ENCOA, then I'm gonna go forward and it will make more sense. Um, actually, no, I'm going to stop my sentence because it won't make any sense if we haven't defined ENCOA. So ENCOA stands for the National Center for Optical and Infrared Astronomy. And it's uh, an, a concept that's generally been in the air for quite some time, but that it's grown legs and moved forward over the last two years. And the concept is that, uh, with some analogy to the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is uh, held up by several programmatic pillars, the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, now WFIRST, a substantial EPO program. Uh, there's also, um, I forget the name of the division, but a uh, data science division led by Arfan Smith. There's this set of uh, you know, scientific missions and programs that the Institute is built around. And the staffing for those um, is a fluid between them in this a matrix management system. So for example, you aren't you know, hired just to work on HST forevermore, and then when HST's uh, mission is ramping up, you're out of a job, you're able to move around uh, and change your functionality over time, whether you're a technician, an engineer, or a scientist. And so the ground-based optical infrared system, uh, which uh, as federally funded in the United States, 
includes Gemini, includes NOAO, and will include LSST once construction is over. Um, the idea is that these will form the three programmatic pillars of a national integrated center for optical and infrared astronomy, where ultimately once this uh, integrated uh, restructuring is done, staff who are employed by any of these centers could over time, you know, switch their uh, functional duties to go uh, between any or the other, or any given snapshot in time it may in fact support activities in more than one of the centers. Again, much like many staff at Space Telescope, at one point in time are supporting more than one of the different space missions because there's a lot of um, activities in common uh, to, in, to enable the science and to enable the technology. So uh, there's been documentation submitted to the National Science Foundation formally uh, a few months ago. We just had a review several weeks ago in DC that was run by the NSF to, um, to review the concept that was put forward uh, in advance of this concept going before the National Science Board uh, for making a recommendation to France Cordova and the NSF to whether to move forward with this integrated national center. And it looks like uh, things are moving forward smoothly. Um, if things go as expected, uh, we will get to the formal green light to, to do this implemented integration of these centers with a currently planned start date of the more integrated center of October 1st of 2018. Although Steve said that very important point that LSST construction activities will not be part of this integrated center, but as operations ramps up, our staff will ramp up uh, within NCOA. So you can imagine that with this uh, larger set of opportunities, you know, looking ahead to the future, you can imagine if there's, um, you know, a future uh, large aperture telescope that there's U.S. federal involvement in, the structure of NCOA is such that you can naturally fit such a new program within NCOA. If there's a new, you know, a wide field multi-object spectrograph on a 10 meter class telescope sometime in the next decade with federal involvement, the structure would naturally allow for such another new program to be implemented within NCOA. So. Uh, folks who are employed by LSST uh, through through Aura through NCOA will be able to look ahead and say, you know, there may be new opportunities for me in the future. I'm not going to be out of a job on the 360, you know, fourth day of the 10th year of LSST operations. Um, and we also think just with a larger uh, science, a technical, and engineering environment, it'll pr provide a, a quite stimulating uh, environment to be a part of. So. We're not changing our functional plans. I think it will enable uh, synergies with Gemini and NOAO that will um, expand LSST science outside the boundaries of what we'll actually get funding for. Um, you know, coordination with Gemini, uh, potentially target of opportunity, uh, work with their new single object spectrograph, NOAO's interest in supporting the community to do NOAO science and to help to build a time domain system. All of those ties will be strengthened. Um, so it, it will be value added, but what's in our funding umbrella is not going to be different. Excellent. Are there any other questions? So there's nothing left on the chat and it's 4.59, so we're perfectly on time to wrap this call up. Um, thank you very much, Victor, for the slides. This looks terrific. Um, I thought it was quite impressive and great to see that everything is moving at pace. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have a list of future PSD topics. I also have set up a, a Google Doc for you to propose more topics. Uh, we have a tentative calendar that I will submit to the chairs um, in the coming week and uh, we'll, we'll have the next meeting sometimes in January. Stay tuned for the date. I will upload the, the minutes and the summary of the of um, the meeting on community and open up a, a page for further discussion. And if there is nothing else, thank you very much for participating. Thank Thanks. you, Sandy. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.